Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you a loft conversion example. This topic has been requested by a number of people, so I thought I'd uh, do it. It doesn't really come up very often in the companies I've ever worked with. Uh, maybe in a smaller company, it's something which might come up more, more often. Being able to design a loft conversion is going to be very, very useful. If you're going to be fortunate to own your own house, you may want to do a loft conversion yourself. So having experience prior to doing it is going to be really, really beneficial. It's always going to be good experience to do a mixture of projects, big or small. And a small little project like this can be a really, really great experience because it can teach you a lot of things that larger projects can't. A small project like this can teach you, you know, little intricate details which are common in just little residential houses. Um, it's going to teach you about how to fit structure into small, small little details and very confined spaces. How, you know, when you think about designing stuff, you need to think about how the builder is actually going to get some steelwork into the house. You know, it's a small space. Are they going to need a splice connection? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to be doing is to assess the information on the drawings. I was fortunate enough that the client on this project was actually an architect, so he produced some pretty good drawings already for me to use. And so the first drawing I'm going to be looking at is his um, demolition plan. And I can quickly tell straight away that he's creating some new openings in the existing wall. As a first pass of these drawings, I'm just going to cloud key structural items and just make a quick note of sort of where I think structure is going to be required. So my thought process here is, okay, we're opening up a wall. Now, I'm going to need to know if these walls are low bearing or not. And just by a quick glance of the upper floors, I can make a pretty educated guess that I think that these walls are definitely going to be low bearing. I'm going to reinforce this assumption by indicating where I think the existing joists are spanning. So now I'm kind of just going around the drawing, looking at the annotations that the architect has already made and just highlighting and just making a note for myself to see if there is any structural requirements. This is an important note because they're proposing to remove the chimney inside the building, but obviously they're going to retain the chimney sticking out of the roof. So I need to work out which chimneys they're removing and how am I going to support the remaining chimney in the loft. So now I've moved on to the actual proposed GA drawings and I'm having a look at this chimney stack. So if you looked at the ground and first floor plans, you could clearly see that there were two chimney breasts or fireplaces. And as you come into the loft, it becomes just one. So at some point there's a transition between two and one chimneys. So my thought process here is we're going to need to stick in a new beam to support this chimney breast at the new loft level. So I'm thinking that this wall on first floor level is also a masonry wall and whether or not it was designed as a low bearing wall initially, I can turn it into a low bearing wall because I know that the loft floor is not going to be very heavy. Because of the way the architect has drawn it for me, I'm doing a quick check to make sure that the new loft wall is actually in line with the wall below it. This is going to be useful for two reasons. Um, the first one is going to be the new loft floor. So this is going to be brand new joists and also, which I'll get onto later, is the new roof ridge beam. Like before, I'm going to mark on the span direction for these timber joists, but instead of existing joists, I'm marking on what I'm proposing as the new joists. There's going to be a new staircase leading into the new loft area, so that means there's going to be a hole or an opening within the new loft floor. So we're going to need some trimming steels or trimming beams to trim out this opening. 
Because the span is quite short at only 3.4 meters and it's really not taking much load because it's not supporting the floor, I'm thinking that these trimming beams could be made out of timber instead of steel to save some money, but I'll need to do the design to confirm whether it needs to be a steel or it could be timber. There's another chimney stack which needs to be supported so I'm just going to be adding in another steel beam here as well. Here I'm just double checking on the other floor plans that there's definitely the removal of the chimney breast at first floor or ground floor level. So here I actually realised that the new timber joists that we're putting in and the new steel beams supporting the chimney breast are not actually supported on the wall below. So I'm going to be putting in a new steel beam spanning the whole width of the house to pick up these two steel beams supporting the chimney and also supporting the new loft floor. So looking at the first floor load bearing wall, I'm not entirely sure if the existing lintel is going to be mad enough to support the new loads. So I'm just going to specify a lintel or a beam and then I can check it out later. I forgot to add a trimming beam to form the landing so I'm just going to put that in here and then also I just put in a cross to sh make sure that it's obvious it's a void. So I'm very fortunate that the architect has drawn a very good section and by looking at the section it just makes everything that much clearer. So I'm going to be marking on everything which I had done on the GA plans but also this is a good opportunity to mark on some of the stuff which I didn't really show on the GA plans like the new roof rafters or the new ridge beam. So what I'm thinking here is instead of the ridge beam spanning the full width of the house, I can utilize this stud wall which is on the same line as the load bearing wall below and make it into a load bearing stud wall which can support the ridge beam. If the spans are small enough, I could even make the ridge beam out of timbers instead of a steel beam which is what I've indicated at the moment. Back on the loft GA plan, I'm going to mark on the load bearing stud wall and that way I can see how far the ridge beam will need to span and that can help me determine whether or not the ridge beam will need to be made out of steel or if it could be made out of timber instead for it to be cheaper. I'm also going to put a dash line here just to indicate where the ridge beam above is going to be. Just for clarity, I'm just going to indicate where the load bearing wall is below. I think that I'm actually done marking up the main structure for this loft extension now. So now I'm going to make a list of all the things which I need to design.
So these were the calculations which I did for the actual project. I won't be going into detail on how I design everything, but this is just going to be a brief overview on how I set the calculations up and what I'm actually designing. So I start off with an introduction to the project and I kind of briefly explain on what's going on, what's been proposed and what structural items I'm going to be designing. Next I'm going to be defining the loads which I'm going to be used for my designs and I list out all the proposed new loads and I also assume some of the existing loads as well. I insert a section through the building and mark it up with all the structure which I'm going to be designing. This is going to make it really really clear for the reader to know exactly what I'm going to be doing. So first of all I'm going to be designing the new flat timber rafters. I note the span of the rafters and also the dead and live load. I won't be doing these designs by hand, um, I'm going to be using a piece of software called TEDS and basically I just plug in the numbers and make sure I get all the parameters right and then I basically confirm the design. I know that I advocate on this channel to do hand calculations but because I've done these hand calculations before plenty of times um, I don't just really see the need to do them anymore. They take a little bit of time to do even with my experience so it's just that much quicker just to plug in the numbers into this piece of software. I'm sure I'll do a timber design tutorial at some point so make sure you remember to like and subscribe to get notified for when I do release that new video. So the reason I do this steel beam design by hand is because I can actually do it quicker than going through the program. It's not just the time doing the design, but when you go through a piece of software, you have to remember to save it, export it to PDF, and then sort of compile it all together. And that can actually take quite a lot of time. So I'll do a hand calculation when I think it's going to be a time saver for me. And in this instance, that's what I do. So for this next beam, I set the calculation up by hand, but then I, again, I use the piece of software just to quickly spit out the design. So this is a design of a lintel and a lintel behaves slightly differently to a beam not because of the lintel itself but because of what it's supporting. Because it's supporting masonry the masonry can basically arch and when it arches that load is not going to be uniformly distributed like it normally would say if it was a floor spanning onto a beam. I'll go more in depth on how to design a lintel in another video. So here are some of the sketches which I did to accompany the structural markup and the calculations. This is to make it abundantly clear to the architect, the client and also the builder to know exactly what to do and how to build it. Hopefully you found this video interesting and helpful. If you've got any questions please drop me a comment or please get in touch via LinkedIn. Please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers!